hope one of the things that we're getting from this is that there are loads of astronomical signs that we should be paying attention to right now. I've not done any work on the blood moons. There's been so much great work about the lunar tetrad and the blood moons falling on the Hebrew feasts and the solar eclipse in the middle, all of those kinds of things and how significant that might be. So much good work has been done about that. But if we factor in what's happening with the blood moons, then what's happening with Jupiter? This The, the process that starts 21 years after Shoemaker-Levy 9, it enters into the constellation Leo, which, by the way, it enters into that constellation the same month uh, in July that uh, that Shoemaker-Levy crashed into the planet Jupiter, you know, in 1994. It comes into the sign of kingship in 2015. It moves through that sign and then begins to gestate in the constellation Virgo until finally as its birth, we have this sign in the heavens that looks remarkably like what occurs in Revelation 12. Again, Andy Reese did a wonderful YouTube video uh, on the blood moons and what they might mean and what they might not mean. And he's the one that, that brought out the sign. And what I gathered from that is that it may even be more significant than the blood moons themselves that these three planets are in Leo while Jupiter's being born. What might that mean for us? It could be as big a deal as Jesus coming back because these signs are closely connected to his advent, his coming to the earth. Maybe it's a sign of his second coming. Maybe it's a sign of all of us coming into the commission of the next age, the next part of the story of God and man, which is a story about true, immortal, eternal kingship. It might be something about us coming into our own. If I'm just having to guess, and I don't want to make um, huge statements like it's Jesus's return, but I'm not entirely sure what it is, I might say it this way. I think that this period, starting with 2015 to 2017, is a very important window where we might begin to discover more of our immortal life, more of our immortal kingship than we ever have before. If that culminates with Jesus coming back, Praise be to God, that's the one I'm rooting for. If it's us coming into our own and demonstrating to the world true human kingship, then I'll take that too. All of those options are great. Now, before we get too excited about any of this, let's just take a step back and ask, how common are these astronomical signs? Well, is it common to have a blood moon tetrad? Well, relatively common. It doesn't happen all the time, but you know, Jewish feasts fall on the phases of the moon where this would happen. They fall on full moons. So to have the the Jewish feasts correspond with, you know, lunar eclipses, that does happen throughout history. Sometimes it's very significant. Sometimes nothing happens concerning the nation of Israel. Again, Andy Reese did wonderful work in his uh, video about the blood moons to kind of see what does it mean and what does it not mean. So is it common? Sometimes it's common. Well, how common is it to have Jupiter in the constellation Leo? Very common. Jupiter will be in Leo every 12 years and will stay there for one year. The same is true of Virgo. How common is it to have a conjunction of Jupiter and Venus, like what you saw when Jesus was born in the last video blog, and of course what you saw at the beginning of 2015, where we have this, or I'm sorry, the beginning of July in 2015, when we have this conjunction of Jupiter and Venus? Well, it's again relatively common. Every couple of years, Jupiter and Venus are going to be very close in the night sky. How common is it to have Jupiter, Jupiter and Virgo, again, once every 12 years for a whole year? How common is it to have three planets in Leo? Okay, now we're getting to some things that are a little less common. How common is it to have Jupiter being birthed out of Virgo's womb while the three planets are in the constellation Leo above her head? Now that is much, much, much less common. That's something we don't see often at all. In fact, I have not looked back in the 2000 years, but other people have said this sign is so rare, it may not have even happened for 2000 in the last 2000 years. And then still, we have to look at the most uncommon event, uncommon event of all of the ones that we've talked about on these video blogs. And that happens to be the comet breaking up into 21 pieces and crashing into the surface of the planet Jupiter. 
Now, of all of these events, that is the most rare. In fact, it's so rare, it had never been recorded before. So if one of these events we could consider, uh, you know, like a flashing neon sign in the sky, I would think it's the one where we actually watched a comet crash into a planet, breaking up into 21 pieces before it did so. Now that is a rare sign. Now you could make the case that even though a lot of these astronomical events uh, happen from time to time, you could make the case that uh, it's, not, it's not a big deal. But the same could be true of when the Magi were looking at the sky when Jesus was born. Again, Jupiter is in Leo once every 12 years. It's going to go in retrograde motion around Regulus relatively often. So the Magi, the wise men that knew something was going on in the firmament, they were sensing more than just what the lights themselves were doing. They knew that that particular conjunction of Jupiter and Venus at the time of Jesus' conception or birth, they knew that was significant. They knew that was his star. They knew when Jupiter circled around Regulus that it was significant because it lined up with so many other prophecies as well. This was a time when they were expectant to see Jesus's or, or the Messiah's first advent on the earth. So taken as a whole, they knew something was going on. If they had just seen Jupiter enter into the constellation Leo, I doubt the Magi would have picked up and left and gone to find the king, the one that was to rule the nations. So you can make the case that none of these astronomical signs mean anything. And that's really where we are in America. That's where we are with our modern Western civilization that, oh, it happens all the time. It doesn't mean anything. But what if we get in tune just a little bit with the sky as a great big cosmic clock? What if we take the blood moons, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet event, the two bright comets after that, we fast forward 21 years later, we see Jupiter enter the sign of kingship. Maybe there's a conception there of something. And then we see it actually move into the womb before it is finally born. We have this sign that mimics the, the text of, and, the, and the, the mood even of Revelation chapter 12. And on top of all of that, we know to expect certain things at this time 2,000 years after Christ has been here. We know things are coming. Could it be that all of these astronomical signs taken as a whole should make us wake up just a little bit, start to sense what God is saying about kingship, and maybe even what he's saying about the full realization of Messiah? One thing I've believed is that our losing touch with the cosmic clock and our loss of the knowledge of the firmament the way that God intended for it to be, our, our misunderstanding of the meaning of time, I believe that all of that has played right into the hands of anyone and anything, any person, any being that opposes God's plan for the restoration of humankind. So much of that plan can be seen in the firmament. And so for us to lose touch with it, for us to lose our place in time and to lose the meaning of what's going on around us and this crucial element, the firmament, time itself in visible form, that's what the firmament is. So to lose that would seem to play right into the hands of any person or any being that doesn't want us to be connected to where we are in the story of the redemption of man. So there is absolutely a God agenda being worked out on the earth for the last six millennia. It's been going on for some time. and We've read it in the Bible from Genesis to our present day. So if God has a plan and God has an agenda for restoration, then there is certainly also a counterfeit to that plan. Oftentimes, you can see the counterfeit plan played out in entertainment, movies that come out of Hollywood. This is a very age-old tradition of using entertainment to put forth something other than what God is putting forth. 
So you can oftentimes find in a movie or in a book maybe a little of the propaganda of that opposing team, you know, the the anyone or the anything that opposes God's agenda of restoration for humankind. You can see the the propaganda that that the other team wants out there in things like movies and books. And while we may have lost our connection to the cosmic clock, the people that are working that false idea, that false agenda, that false plan, the people that are working that into entertainment, they have absolutely not forgotten about the cosmic clock. So not surprising, here we are on the doorstep of some major events happening with Jupiter, some significant astronomical signs, and out comes a movie called Jupiter Ascending. And here we have two very well-known actors starring in a blockbuster movie, and the movie contains all kinds of really weird things. I confess that I saw it in the theater because I had a hunch that, that there would be some of that, um, some of that false agenda propaganda, some of the things that you know are hinting at what's really happening, but but put through this filter where it gets all messed up and jumbled so that it really just ends up confusing people. But it's interesting that that movie is about someone coming to power. It's essentially a messianic story. It's also interesting that they're coming to power to try to stop a harvest from taking place on the earth where, will, where billions of souls will be harvested all at once, and they're trying to stop that harvest from taking place. And again, I'm not suggesting that the movie does a good job of telling the truth about anything, but it does give us a few tells that the people that made the movie might know exactly that what times we're living in right now. So we have this movie called Jupiter Ascending about someone coming to power. It's the story of a messiah coming to earth, of course, told through this really um, kind of false filter that confuses the issues and jumbles it all up. It's interesting, though, that one of the first lines of the movie, maybe within the first five minutes of the movie, the main character, a young girl, says that she was born when Jupiter was moving into the house of Leo. Now, as I was sitting in the theater, I had just finished recording, maybe a day or two before, the first video blog in the Jupiter Rising series. And of course, I called it Jupiter Rising to do a little bit of a play off of the, the name of this movie. But as I was sitting in the theater and the main character says that I was born when Jupiter was moving in or was in the house of Leo, I thought to myself, there's no way that that's a coincidence. Surely someone with an enormous amount of influence that's either writing the script or you know, producing the movie, someone knows that we're living in a very significant time. And of course, it concerns what's happening in the sky with Jupiter. So if there are people out there that might know the significance of the times we're living in, it stands to reason that God would want us to know. We are, after all, his people. And if anyone truly has the authority to tell time, it's God's people. If anyone truly has the authority to interpret the signs in the heavens, it's God's people. And certainly, if there's anyone on this earth that should know where we are in the story of our redemption, it's us. <laughs>